does speak and does rule because of its its freshness and its newness then it's wondered at it surprises us and it, it lifts us in that sense because we're going to talk in a few minutes about a king who didn't do that a king that was always there always seen and by usage became unrecognizable if you like here is conscious prodigality of a high order so that we hear in its echoes of that original son God's prodigal did he not so cover up his glory and descend into time so that he might as man teach men how to yoke their idleness to service okay a reference here to the fact that God in creating is yoking, yoking his idleness his energy into work by building the universe in the first place by structuring it organizing it into places and time and space was not this, his parable on the subject a hinting of the process he himself would undergo? And just as we are dazzled by the spectacle of Christ's resurrection after his eclipse, so will the prince's subject be when he pleases again to be himself. And like the prodigal son, he will be the more loved for his stooping to our lower common touch of humankind. And provided on the subject a hope of emulation. So, okay, you've got here a reflection, if you like, uh, one of those situations, you know, like a, a Russian doll within a Russian doll, within a Russian doll, within a Russian doll. You've got this image of God coming into the world and, and actually generating the universe, creating all that is. And that's being represented, we've said, mentioned through Adam and through the king, to represent itself throughout the hierarchy of social structures, human beings working for themselves and design, designing inside themselves a hierarchy so that they too are structured and layered. Does that make sense? Mm. Yep. So we've got this interrelating holes within holes within holes, which is the way the universe seems to organize itself. One of the fascinating sort of descriptions which I first came across through Arthur Kessler was the fact that he said everything in the universe looks two ways it's Janus light and Janus is the the god that we recognize in January he's the gods of doorways every doorway looks into and out of a situation and Janus looks into the year and into the next year so January is that turning point to the end of the year and Kessler said this Janus-like quality of everything, whether it's a social structure, an atom, a universe, a world, a person, an animal, whatever, we have to recognize that they are made of parts, and they themselves are a part of something bigger. Now that means, <clears throat> if you look at the human body, it's made of parts. When we analyze it, it's made of parts. The whole disintegrates, disappears, and what we see are all the parts which function together to create that being. And yet we look at the whole person, we only understand them in terms of the parts they play in bigger unities. So that might be a politician or a plumber or a school teacher or a miner or whatever. And we look at them and we say, well, their wholeness is a function of this bigger unit that governs everything they do. So wherever we look, things disappear into being parts of bigger systems or created by smaller systems. And this is true of worlds, of atoms, of planets, of social systems, of books, of whatever. Anything you can think of, you will be able to see it as a part of something and also made of parts. And this is the way that our world tends to shatter things from holes into partials. So whenever you're looking at something, you have to analyze it two ways. What is it, what is it made of? What are the parts that constitute it? And what is it itself a part of? And your wholeness will express itself in the things you participate in. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a very valuable concept. It comes again in different, different ways. That's the first way I came across it was through Arthur Kessler. And he calls it the whole on, because everything is a whole on. It's a whole and a part at the same time. And that's the <coughs> that's 
that's the way to. So Eugene and David have just described this drawing from the plays that this idea of a king and a kingdom is expressing that. The, kings, the kingdom is made up of tiny people all involved in different su structures. We class them now as social structures and um, commercial structures, etc., to create the kingdom that he is the head of. So that unity is made of parts. And that itself is part of a greater part, which we would call the, the nation, the world, outer and outer and outer. And, outer. and that this is even God, the God, concept of God, which they would have had, is of, a, of something which is expressed in this universe, which is working constantly towards its own metafunction. Right. <clears throat> The echoes of the Christ story continue into the play in which Hal enters into his kingship as Henry V. So Hal then comes through his, if you like, his Prince of Walesness, and he then becomes the king, Henry, on the death of his father. The son is crowned and assumes his father's place. He actually takes the crown off his dead father. And we're not too sure whether his father's dead. <clears throat> that is a usual, a usual enough correlation of God and king. In this coronation, the likenesses between the Christian and the political processes are more specific, more pointed. For example, just as Jesus the Christ is the risen prodigal, the regenerate Adam coming phoenix-like, growing out of his own ashes, to grace out of the disgraced ashes of the old Adam, so is Harry of England come to his throne. Canterbury, that means the Archbishop of Canterbury, is not slow to set the swelling scene. Have we another speaker who would love to rattle their tonsils around this little no, thing? No. The breath no sooner left his father's body, but that his wildness mortified in him seemed to die too. Yea, at this at that very moment consideration like an angel came, and whipped the offending Adam out of him leaving his body as a paradise to envelop and contain celestial spirits. Right. Nicely read. Mm -hmm. So we have here Canterbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury is giving the description of an elder of a younger person that no sooner had <coughs> the old king died than Harry's wildness seemed to die in him too. Seemed to die with the old man. And consideration like an angel came and whipped the offending Adam out of him. So all that wildness is gone, leaving his body as a paradise, as a place in which there is no argument, no um, travail, no conflict to envelop and to contain celestial spirits. So again, the perfection, the balance of the wholeness of the enterprise <coughs> suddenly is represented in this, in this man as he takes the throne. Adam, the type of man means red earth. The paradisical garden is the body of Adam from which must be with the offense of disobedience. And the individual realm of the being may be a fit habitation for its ruler spirit. There can be no denying the conscious link here between Christ the King and his, and his earthly representative, the monarch. Now, that part thing, when you first read this, I mean, I probably is the same as you as with me, this idea of whipping uh, the offense of disobedience. I think what it, we have to take this as being the process by which levels inside ourselves are contained and controlled. I remember talking to Eugene one, uh, about this once and he said you've got to remember that inside of you are tremendously violent forces. So quite simply, your digestive juices, I think hydrochloric acid was mentioned, if they weren't toned and disarmed by the mucus inside your own stomach, would burn through the floor if they dropped on it. So powerful are these organic acids, which we control inside, contain inside ourselves. Explosive stuff, chemically very violent. We have to tear the food apart with these things. I'm a delicate eater, I don't know about you chaps, but I mean, you just think how much or it has to be, be gone in to, to digest food, to break it down, to turn it into you. There are fires inside these, these processes. 